tonight's guest is Brian Tyrrell. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Brian, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, uh, right now I'm a school teacher at a career tech in Oklahoma. I teach air conditioning technology. And before that, I was an air conditioning service person by trade. And uh, I drove a service truck for many, many years. Spent a lot of time on the highway. And I got to see a lot of things. Some things I uh, wish I hadn't seen. But I've always been a big outdoorsy type person. Hunted just about everything Oklahoma has to offer. I just enjoy being out in the woods, and that's really me in a nutshell. Well, there's nothing wrong at all with spending all that time out in the woods. I wish I could do more of that myself. (laughs) Speaking of that, do you see the woods as being a more exciting, interesting place now, now that you know dogmen are out there, or more of a place to be feared and avoided? I would say it definitely has to be respected. For a long time, I... um, would go into the woods completely unarmed. I don't do that anymore. It's, I wouldn't say feared, but, and and maybe I'm misguided on this, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to let it stop me from going out and spending time outdoors. Although I will admit, ever since I came to the conclusion that these things are out there, you know, every little stick that snaps or falls or makes some noise or little noises, I definitely pay a lot more attention to, and uh, I definitely keep my head on a swivel. Well, that's totally understandable. Yeah, that doesn't make you any different from most eyewitnesses. I'm just glad that you still head out into the woods and enjoy yourself. That's great. Mm Mm-hmm. Dogman sightings aside, Brian, what would you say has been the most frightening experience you've had in the woods? (laughs) Well, that would be a Sasquatch sighting uh, encounter. I didn't see it, but. I had a nighttime encounter with what I think was a couple of juveniles back in 2019 in southeastern Oklahoma. They came into my camp, and from what I could kind of guess, they were being ornery, and they were exploring and getting into stuff. And one came within about 15 feet of me sleeping in a hammock, and it scared the bejeebers out of me. I ain't going to lie. Well, that would frighten almost anyone. I don't blame you. Yeah. I wish I'd have got a visual on them. Yeah, I wish you could have too. Although, maybe it's better not to see a Sasquatch if <laughs> you might really freak out if you do see one. So, I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, sometimes things are better left unseen. That's right. Have you been in the woods since you had your first encounter once without thinking about the possibility that a dogman might have been around? No, not really. Sometimes during the daytime, as long as I'm close to the truck, probably doesn't pop into my mind as much. But, you know, as soon as I start getting away from the vehicle and start getting more into areas that would whole potential ambush situations, you know, with lots of cover. You know, it just comes rushing to the front of my mind. I'm always trying to be aware of potential ambush situations. Try to avoid them. (laughs) Well, yeah. Once bitten, twice shy. Yeah. You used to do a lot of coyote hunting, from what I understand. Do you still hunt them now that you've had those encounters? No, I wouldn't say that that was the reason. I would say the reason is, is I'm just getting a little older now and I still would like to go coyote hunting more often, but it's kind of one of those things you kind of like to have somebody to go with you. And I don't know, I guess it's just not at the front of my mind anymore. I'm focused more on, you know, looking for these cryptids and going camping and putting myself in situations where I might have another encounter. That seems to have taken up most of my time in the last few years, really. Yeah, it sounds like you do put a lot of time into it. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Knowing the woods as well as you do, 
Do you think dogmen are the alpha predator in any woods where they live in North America, or do you think that that title belongs to something else? Well, they're definitely an alpha. Whether they're the alpha or not, that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, everybody wants to talk about dogmen versus Sasquatch, and everybody wants to see a WWF match with those two, but I really don't think that happens. I'm sure that they probably avoid each other like the plague. But uh, I would say they're definitely, if they're not number one on the alpha chart, they are definitely number two. It uh, probably just depends on the individual, would be what I would say. Even in grizzly country? Well, I don't know. Um, grizzlies can get really big. And uh, I think that would be a heck of a fight. I don't, I, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. That's a tough call. I'm not sure who I'd put my money on there. <laughs> well, I definitely want some popcorn if I was able to see that fight. From a distance. <laughs> yeah, definitely from a distance. And probably from inside of an M1 Abrams, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Exactly. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. You collect dogman encounters from eyewitnesses in Oklahoma and southern Kansas. What have been some of the most remarkable encounters that have been shared with you? Well, a few years ago, I had a guy reach out to me. He was an oil field guy. And he was, he was kind of distraught. I mean, I wouldn't say distraught, but you could tell that it, it definitely had an impact on him. And he told me this story that he was coming home late at night and he was going around this curve up by uh, Manchester, Oklahoma. Sorry about that. And uh, he was going around these curves and he saw, I guess he was running down the highway at night. And he had these big off-road lights on, and it was kind of lighting up everything. And he said he saw this dog in the distance sitting by the side of the highway. And as he got closer, he said that the dog stood up on its four legs. And he went around the corner. As he's going around the corner, he looked at it. He thought, that dog looks like a wolf. And he was thinking, you know, we're out here in cattle country what kind of farmer would have a wolf for a dog or a wolf hybrid for a dog? And that's just not going to be a good mix, you know? And he's just thinking this is not good. Well, he had to slow down to go through the curve and the dog was on the curve. Well, as he went around the curve, the dog started running alongside him. That's when he noticed that it was actually a, a very large dog. And he started accelerating as he came out of the, curve and the dog began running beside his truck he could see it through the passenger window and he could see it plain as day and he thought it was kind of unusual that he could actually look out the passenger window and actually see this dog from this full-size truck and it was running that close he, he thought this is, must be a really big dog and uh, he said he began speeding up and the dog was keeping pace with him and about the time he hit 55 miles an hour, he said the dog stood up on its hind legs and started running bipedally and looking in the window at him. And uh, I guess this just, that was the point where it was just like, okay, this is some totally unholy stuff. I don't know what I'm looking at. So he punches it and he starts speeding up. And he gets up to, he said that the creature accelerated with him and it continued to keep pace with him up until the point when he got to about 70 miles an hour. And that's when he began to walk away and leave the creature. And uh, the guy was upset about it, didn't know what to think about it. And I guess he got online and started looking around. And um, one of my friends knew him. And uh, gave him my number. We got in contact and we uh, talked about it. But I'm sure it was 
pretty scary for the guy. He said that he could actually see it in the the lights from his uh, off road lights. You know, they're kind of wide beam, and he said he could even see it on the side of the truck there running alongside him, and it was lit up pretty good. He said it was a really big animal. Now, he said if he had to guess, it would have probably standing up, it probably would have been seven foot tall. But, you know, that's kind of one of those things where I, I'll cut the guy some slack. It's kind of hard to tell how tall something is when it's running alongside your truck, you know. <laughs> but I always thought that was a very interesting story. I wasn't aware that these things could actually move that fast. You know, I talked to you off air and you confirmed that they can. I wasn't aware of that. I thought that was pretty unique. And I, I had another story that was pretty interesting. I had a lady reach out to me and a nice lady from up in Kansas. And I've been meaning to go up and actually do an interview with her. But uh, she told me that when she was a young girl, she was staying with her grandparents' house. I believe she said she was like 14. She was a teenager. And uh, she was staying in El Reno, Oklahoma with her grandparents. And she had... Basically, what she saw was a wolf looking in the bedroom window. And this creature had to have been very tall to look in her bedroom window. But um, she thinks that that was the beginning of uh, basically these things apparently following her. She later got married and moved to Kansas. And uh, wasn't long after you know she settled down in Kansas that it was almost like they found her again and uh, they started coming around the place where she lives and they would kind of stalk her and her daughter as they were walking down the road to go to their home. I guess she said there was a hedgerow and this hedgerow was uh, kind of made out of some viney type stuff uh, around Kansas and Oklahoma, they'll kind of grow with these roses in them and they'll grow wild along fence lines, and along roads. And she said that this thing would just, just be on the other side of the hedgerow when she was trying to walk back to her house at night. And uh, I guess this happened on a regular basis. She said one time the thing started growling at her and her daughter. And I guess her daughter was like, three at the time and they ran back to the house three or four and she ran back to the house and they thought they were in the clear because they got up on the front porch and they both thought that they were safe on the porch and i guess they sat down in a you know one of those rocking swings those porch swings and i guess the thing came up and was in their front yard and i guess it growled or roared at them and i guess it scared them real bad and they ran in the house but this lady has had them coming around her property for years they'll come up and there's a tree that they scratch on and they scratch pretty high up and i guess they've tried to claw their way into her shed the outside of her house and she's basically you know hurt them moving around and making noise and stuff out in the backyard and I guess when her daughter was a teenager, I want to say she was roughly the 14, probably the same age that her mom was, her daughter saw this dog man looking in the window. And she, they had a trailer house, you know, and on trailer houses, the, the windows are pretty high up off the ground. So you'd have to be a, a pretty tall creature to stare in the window on one of those sometimes. But I guess that scared her daughter pretty bad at the time. Her daughter's a grown woman now. But even up until recently, she had what she believes one hop up on her back porch. She didn't see it on the back porch, but she was telling me that, I think you said it was 2020 or 2021. I can't remember. But she said that she was sitting in her living room watching TV and she heard something basically hop onto her back porch and her back porch is kind of like uh, one of those trying to think what it's called, like a a deck that's made out of wood. And she said that the the deck was just creaking and it was making all this noise. Like the boards were about to break and 
she could hear like this cracking and stuff like this is this thing was walking up and down on her back deck and she said that she knew that whatever it was just had to be like exceptionally heavy because she said she has a neighbor a neighbor guy that comes over every once in a while to visit and she said that uh, he weighs like 300 pounds and when he's up there the boards don't even creak or nothing you can't even tell but whatever this was she knew that it was definitely considerably heavier than this guy and uh, this thing came up and was messing with the back doorknob and uh, apparently it was locked and uh, it starts scratching down at the bottom of the door and she actually sent me some photos of she had a metal door on the back of it and you can actually see where this thing had muddy paws or something and it looked like something had been scratching on her back porch door and uh, I'm sure that must have been very, very frightening for a older widowed woman to be there alone by herself and have to be dealing with this stuff. And uh, my heart really goes out to her. I wish I had some uh, great advice. I told her that she probably needs to put up more security lights. And I don't know if she's going to be able to do that. But she's just been having these things off and on visit her. And she said something, and it just kind of made me think. But she just made, when I was talking to her, she made a casual statement. She said, they just like to scare me. And when she said that, I couldn't help but wonder, how did she know that? And uh, I just get this feeling that, you know, there was some kind of bond there. And I can't really, you know, say that that's a fact. But I just kind of got that feeling that she just knew that these things like to torment her. And I've heard that same consistent theme off and on on your show and on other dogman stories, you know, where people say that these things have followed them home and they just it's like they enjoy scaring people. And I just felt like that's exactly what was going on there. And I thought it was strange that she had her first encounter when she was an adolescent, young teenage girl, and her daughter ended up having almost the exact same encounter many years later, just in a different location. And I just thought that that story was fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to going up and interviewing her. But wow, what would that be like to have them come into your house off and on for 45, 50 years? How do you do that? I don't know. Poor lady. <laughs> yeah, poor lady is right. I can only imagine what she's been through after the past 40 to 50 years with those guys. Yeah, that's horrible. I am glad, though, that she understands that that's the MO behind them doing what they're doing. They just want to frighten her. Obviously, if they wanted to break in and get her, they could have done that at any time, but they haven't done that because, like she knows, they just want to get a rise out of her. Mm -hmm. I told her she should probably just stay in the house at night and whatever she needs to do during the day to do it during the daytime. And she did mention that they primarily come around after the sun has gone down. So Probably because I know it's going to frighten her that much more, but <laughs> probably it's hard to say. It really is. Do you only collect encounters, or do you try to help eyewitnesses who contact you as well? Well, when somebody calls you and they're upset and scared, and I've only had a couple of those so far, it's your duty as a human being to try to talk them through it. Sometimes people just need to hear that if that thing would have wanted to kill you, it could have, and it didn't. Sometimes that works for people, but sometimes people get really obsessed with it and they just, they want to do everything they can to keep these things away from them. I do give advice. I've gone out and I've looked at people's property before. Most of the time when I do that, my advice is you need more lighting. Your average house has a 60 watt light bulb on the front porch and one on the back porch. And that's a, that's just like an open invitation to them, you know, to come in and snoop around and get into stuff and torment you. But I like going out and doing investigations 
for people who have had encounters. I like doing interviews and like hearing what people say, but you know, I don't mind spending time on the phone talking with people because I was fortunate enough with my encounters to a have had encountered them at a distance and during the daytime and heck at the time, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I mean, I had no idea in the beginning, but seeing these things to be on foot and to walk up to one and, you know, have an encounter like that, it must be horrifying, especially when you have no idea anything like that really exists. I mean, I've been preparing myself to see one again mentally for several years now. I'm still not sure I'm ready <laughs> from a distance, maybe. Well, it goes without saying, I hope you never do see another one, but I guess time will tell them that. Right. All right, Brian, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well, my first encounter, I think it happened in uh, 2007 in the summertime. And back then I was still doing service work. I worked for a mechanical contractor and I used to go all over northwest oklahoma and even into eastern oklahoma and travel around and my theory on this was is take as many dirt roads and back roads as you can i mean that i just kind of i love doing that it was one of the perks of the job and i was doing that one day i was uh, on my way to i believe alva that day and i was driving and i was taking some dirt roads going back and it was kind of uh, over by Ringwood, Oklahoma, and I was headed north from uh, a little place that people call Mosier Station, and I was taking some dirt roads, and I just I saw it, you know, in the road up ahead at a distance, and I saw this this black thing, and I'm driving down this road, and, you know, I'm in this big lumbering service truck, and I'm just kind of just driving and the sun's out and I see this black thing. And as I got a little bit closer, you know, I was like, well, it must be a black lab or something. And I kept getting closer and closer. And that's when I realized that whatever it was, it was crouched down on the road and it was facing off into the bar ditches. It was actually facing to my right. And it was down on the ground, let real low, kind of like, you know, in the old cartoons, you know, when Wiley Coyote would get down on the ground and just kind of sneak up on something. And I'm slowly getting closer. I let off the gas and I was just kind of coasting closer to it. And as I was getting closer, I realized that is, that is not a black lab. That's something else. The first thing that I noticed was that the body was too long. A dogs, I've seen a lot of lab dogs, and I just knew that the, the body was just too long for this thing. And uh, it was kind of stretched a little bit, kind of like, you know, a mountain lion has like a, a slightly longer body than a dog. And that was the first thing I noticed. It was too long, you know. And uh, then I, I noticed that the tail on it was like super bushy. And it was a long tail, but it was really, really bushy. And as I continued to get closer, I began noticing that something was definitely wrong with this thing's head. Uh, it was off. It was, it was, something was just not quite right. It was definitely not the head of a black lab. And that's when I began to notice that the, it had this shortened muzzle on it. And I would say that it was, you know, I don't know, maybe 60% as long as what a regular dog's muzzle would be. And I was like, what am I looking at? And the ears, the ears were not pointy at all. They were, they were up, but they were rounded, kind of like, kind of like a bear or something. Keep in mind, I had, I had no idea what I was looking at. And it was larger than a, a, a lab. And I'm going to guess it was probably in the, 200 pound range and it was still just focused on whatever this was in the bar ditch 
I'm going to speculate it was a rabbit or something like that, some kind of prey. Well, anyway, I finally got pretty close to it. And I'm, it's kind of hard to say. I would have to go back and retrace my steps on this one. But I'm going to say I got within about less than 50 yards of it. And that's when the thing noticed me. It kind of heard me kind of coming up on it and it turned and it looked at me and it just had this, it was just kind of ugly, you know, and that's when you could really see that the, the nose was short it was when it was kind of moving. It kind of turned and looked at me. You could kind of see that the ears were kind of too small for a wolf type dog. And you know, wolves have like really long pointy ears and, I usually stick up at attention. This thing had these these rounded ears that were not very big at all. But the whole thing was jet black. I mean, just absolutely jet, jet black. When it noticed me, it turned and it looked at me, and it instantly jumped off into the bar ditch and disappeared into some tall, tall grass. And there were some trees there, too, because it was right there by a bridge. And I come rolling up on it. I was, you know, I consider myself to be a very well-rounded outdoorsman. There really ain't anything in Oklahoma that I haven't shot and killed or, or hunted or just very well familiar with. I come rolling up on the spot. I put it park. I get out. And I'm walking around. I'm looking. I'm just like, what in the heck was that? And I was trying to see it, but it was just gone. And, uh, that's when I started realizing it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm outside the vehicle. That thing's right over there, probably. And I just got this creepy feeling that I was making a mistake being out there. So I kind of went back to my vehicle and uh, ended up driving away, totally perplexed, confused. Went to my mom and dad's house because they had one of those uh, animal almanacs, you know, and I was thumbing through that thing. At the time, Vic, it was pretty funny. I, I had it in my head that I'd seen something that I thought was a bear cat because the thing's head kind of looked like a like a bear. But the truth is, is now, knowing what I know, I realized that was one of those, I think it's a type two, the hyena looking ones. But instead of having spots or have that muckle be done for like hyenas do, this thing was completely jet black, but it had that that shortened muzzle that those hyena dog men do. And it was obviously a juvenile. It was, it was not a very big one. And I think that's part of the reason why I was able to get as close to it as I did is because it was hyper-focused on whatever it was. It was hunting in the bar ditch. And it was actually creeping up slowly on this thing, whatever it was. And I saw it actually moving slowly forward. But I was just dumbfounded by what I'd seen. I had no idea. And for years and years, I had no idea what I'd even seen. And, and that, was, that was my first encounter with one. It was more confusing than it was frightening, to be honest, at the time. I wasn't scared. It didn't give me any kind of PTSD or anything. It just, it was just a, a great source of confusion for me because I thought that I had seen some kind of mutant animal. I, I don't even know really what, I can't even remember. I just totally at a loss on that first one because it was so different and so unusual. But another year went by. And uh, I was going out to one of my family's farms. My uncle owns a bunch of land. And I was on my way out. And this was probably, I'm going to guess, December or January of like 2008. And I don't remember the exact reason I was going. But, you know, everything was dead. The grass was kind of dead. And, you know, it was a nice, pretty day. And I was going to go out there. and. The property that's right next to this property has like a little dry creek that flows through it. And sometimes when it rains, you know, the, 
the creek fills up and it'll flow. But then during times of drought, the creek completely dries up. And there's like this little valley that you got to drive through. And there's not a bridge. You just, the road goes down into this valley. And the valley is like, you know, I don't know, 20 foot deep. So you just drive down in there. And at the very bottom where the creek goes through, there's a couple of tin whistles down at the bottom where the water flows through. And then you have to drive back up and out of it. And there's these ledges on the edge, you know, these little, I don't know, you call it like a little butte or something. I'm not exactly sure what the, the appropriate term is, but there's these little cliff faces along the side. And I was driving pretty slow. I always drive pretty slow because I'm always looking. And uh, as I came up on the edge coming into this little valley, I uh, started to go down and I looked off to my left and I saw this this creature sitting on the side, what would be basically the west side. I was looking to the north, but it was sitting on the west side of this little valley. And it was up on that little that little butte, you know, on the high point. And it was sitting there. It had its butt on the ground and its front legs were up. And it was just sitting there in the sunlight. And it was overlooking that valley. You know, I've seen a lot of coyotes and bobcats do similar things. Well, they'll just, they'll find a little high spot and they will watch that valley or watch that low area. They'll look for things like rabbits, quail, you know, prey species that they can, you know, they can sneak up on. And it looked like what he was doing. And he was just sitting there and he had his chest puffed out, but he was just sitting there and it looked like, it looked like everything was going his way. I mean, the sun was out. He was having, looked like he was having a good day until he saw me. And when he saw me, he just turned his head and looked at me and he just gave me this disgusted or, you know, this, this cranky look, you know? And, uh, he just kind of looked at me like, what the, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? And that's, you know, and I looked at him and I was just kind of taking it in for a second or two. And I looked forward by instinct away. I looked at the road, you know, trying to keep, stay on the road or whatever. It's just kind of instinct for people. And I remember thinking, that's a really big dog. And my brain is sitting there working and I'm punching the numbers and I'm thinking that dog is 65 yards away. And, uh, I was like, that's not a big dog. That's like the biggest dog that ever lived. And I, I mean, I'm just like, whoa. And I turn around and I look and he's running away, kind of quartering at a slight angle. And he's running towards the North where there's a, a small patch of trees. And I can see his tail whipping. And he's got this great, big, huge, bushy tail that was very similar to the tail that I saw in the first one. But he was running. and But this one was running kind of peculiar. And anybody that's ever been around bird dogs a lot, sometimes, you know, if you get one of those German short hair pointers, when they're running, they'll lower their butt just a little bit when they run and they'll kind of kick out a little bit further than a normal dog. And it looks kind of funny the first couple of times you see it, but it's just how they run. Well, this dog, this creature, this dog, man, he was kind of doing that. He kind of, he kind of lowered his butt a little bit and he was running and you kind of see him kind of kicking his legs out as he was running away. But he made a beeline for the trees, and he, he disappeared into the trees. But as far as a, an accurate description, he was almost completely black. The sun was kind of on him, and he might have had a little bit of brown in him, maybe a little. But for all intents and purposes, this thing was pure black. His head kind of looked like a, a cross between... I don't know, like a, a black wolf, and he might have had a, a, some German shepherdy type type features. And his ears 
were really tall and pointy. At least they were when I first saw him. And uh, you could, it was almost like you could see that he had, you know, a little tufts of hair coming out of his ears. And he had a, he had a regular looking muzzle, longer. It was a, a long German Shepherd type proportion muzzle, but it actually looked a little bigger from top to bottom. Like it was a thicker muzzle than a normal dog, but not a whole lot. I mean, it was just something that you could just barely notice. But the thing that stuck out to me the most about this dog is when I saw him standing there, his chest was like really wide. You know how sometimes when you see pictures of like pit bulls and they're just kind of sitting there and they're, they got their, their chest all puffed out and it's all muscled up. That's kind of what this guy looked like. And actually I've looked at pictures of wolves online and when you see them from the front they they look very skinny very scrawny and uh, i've even been around a few wolves years ago i i did some service work for a guy that was a wild animal trainer and he had wolves down there and they were always getting out but this thing was built i never saw it get up and run on two legs i never saw its hands but this thing was huge it was probably five and a half feet tall this thing was, I mean, if it was a few more inches taller, it probably could have looked me in the eyes. And I'm six one. This thing was a beast. And it just, it had, it had these muscles and it just, you know, and, and like a, when a wolf, you look at it from the front, his two legs, they almost like touch each other because they, they walk and they're, they're just, I don't know, they just don't have a very wide torso skeletal structure you'll have to forgive me i'm i'm not a a doctor or anything i just i'm just a normal person but but it just they're kind of skinny looking down from the front not this guy this guy was wide i mean his arms were at least 18 inches apart they were they were separated and his chest was puffed out and he just he just looked built but he uh I don't know. He just, it, other than that, he just looked like a wolf, if that makes any sense. Just a really built wolf with some weird skeletal structure. I don't, I don't know. But he ran away, and I never really got to see him again. And I would say the total time elapsed. Uh, the first time I looked at him, I probably looked at him for three seconds and maybe the second time I, I saw him for two seconds as he was as he was running away into the trees and um, again I was confused slightly scared intimidated and um, I come driving back up out of the out of the little valley and my first thought that came to my mind was my brother you know my brother he hunts raccoons out there at night with dogs and my first thought was oh my gosh what if my brother runs into this thing and this thing is as big as a cow so i pulled up and there was this one spot on top of the hill that you could get a cell phone reception back then and so i got on that spot and i called my brother and about the second that i started calling him i, I realized oh god i can't tell him the truth you know, if you've ever had a brother, you know, they, they pick on you and, and, uh, brother or not, you, you can't, you can't just tell somebody, you know, I just seen a 500 pound wolf and I say 500 pounds because I've seen calves about the same size go 500 pounds. And so I'm just speculating, but you know, I, I'm sitting here thinking, I can't tell him how big this thing really is. You know, what I just saw, he'll think I'm nuts, you know. Of course, my brother thinks I'm nuts anyway. Nothing's going to change that, but it's okay. He's, he's my brother. He can think he can think what he wants. So I call him, and I ask him, I was like, hey, have you seen, like, really big black wolf-looking dog running around out here at this place? And he told me no. 
he hadn't seen anything. And to be honest with you, back then, I think my brother was probably running around out there more than I was. But he did mention that he had seen some big tracks uh, down by the dam. And he said that they were, I believe at the time, he said they were bigger than hobos. And hobo was his uh, male walker coon dog. And he was a big one. And so I'm going to speculate, you know, that hobo's tracks were probably four inches crossed. That's pretty big for a big dog. And uh, for Jimmy to notice that they were bigger, that would make for a pretty substantial dog. But he didn't know how big they were. And even heck, back then, we, we didn't know that measuring tracks on something like this was important. I mean, it was just, yeah, they were big tracks. And wish I would have known, but hey, whatever. I didn't even know what I was looking at at the time. I don't even think I heard the term dog man until like 2018 or 17 or something. But anyway, I was talking to him about it for a little while. And, you know, he basically told me he would keep an eye out. And, you know, I kind of let him go. We started referring to this thing as a the wolf dog. We didn't know what else to call it. And uh, every once in a while, I'd ask him, well, have you seen that wolf dog out there? And he's like, well, no, I ain't seen anything. But we did have what I believe was an encounter with this dog man out there at that same farm that we were another mile to the east, or my uncle has. And uh, we were out there coyote hunting. And we had set up, and my brother was actually hunting with me that day. And uh, we had set up in some deer stands. So we had a couple of deer stands and got us up off the ground because it was a pretty deep timber. We weren't hunting open ground. We were down in the trees and in the bush. And um, I set up a little fawn decoy where this fawn's head was just barely sticking up out of the grass. And, and I even used a little doe urine, you know, to give it a little authenticity and um, we set up and we checked the wind and the wind was in our favor. And we would have been A-OK unless a coyote or something came up on us from what would be the, the south. So the wind was in our favor, to put it mildly. So we started calling. I started calling. And uh, all of a sudden, it's like a couple hundred yards to the north. We just hear, I mean, it just sounds like a bull is, is coming through the woods. I remember I kind of looked over at my brother and my brother is looking in that direction because he's definitely hearing it. And I think at that point, both of us took our guns off safety. We were getting ready. And um, there was this, this little strip of cedar trees. There's like five, six cedar trees, maybe seven. And they kind of block the trail coming in from the north. And when I'm deer hunting out of that stand, it serves me real well because the deer can't see me until they walk from out behind those cedar trees and they walk right into my shooting lane and it works out real good. Well, this thing was coming from that direction and my brother was just a little bit to the north of me and he had a slightly different angle. But whatever this thing was, it came running up and it stopped behind those cedar trees and it just kind of stayed there. And keep in mind, the the wind is in our favor. Everything is just right. There's really no reason for it to have stopped. And uh, so we're sitting there, and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And if if you guys got cedar trees wherever you're from, you you know that you can kind of see things moving through them, but you really can't see good at all through them. And we could see something back there behind them moving around. We could see movement happening. and. I don't know how long it sat back there. I really don't remember, but I'm going to say it was, you know, like four or five seconds, maybe seven seconds. And whatever it was, it just, it kind of took off and it headed back the way it came, but it was running. It was moving. You could could hear it, especially in the beginning. You could hear it moving away back to the north the way it came, but it was being much quieter on its way out. And I remember looking over at my brother and my brother turned around and looked at me and he kind of, he didn't say anything. He just kind of said it with his eyes like, what in the heck just happened here? You know, and I'm just like, I kind of shrugged my shoulders. I'm like, I don't know. So we kind of sat still. We kind of figured if it was a coyote or something that maybe it would 
try to circle downwind of us. Maybe we get another shot because we kind of had our back to the lake and there's a pretty good chance of it trying to circle downwind of us that we would have a shot at it, but it, nothing ever did. It, it never circled down. It just, it just left. And, um, I asked my brother later, I was like, well, what did you see? You know, cause he had a different angle. And he's like, well, I don't know. I, he said, whatever it was, it was behind that tree. And, uh, I brought up, I said, do you think it was that wolf dog? And he goes, I don't know. He said, it looked like it might've been more than one animal back there. And I was like, well, okay. And yeah, I think my brother kind of disagrees with me that it might've been the wolf dog, but we just really couldn't see it. But the thing that we both were in agreement on is that everything was in our favor on that set. It should have just come running on in or at least tried to circle around. But whatever it was, it just kind of came running in and it stopped right before we would have had some kind of shot. And it just it was almost like this thing had sixth sense or something like it just knew something. We didn't do anything wrong. Everything was in our favor. That set should have worked, but it didn't. I know that not all sets work all the time. But I just had a feeling. I had a feeling that that was that wolf dog. And then it somehow it busted us. I don't know how, but it did. And that still to this day bugs me about what that thing was. We haven't seen it out there since. We haven't seen any sign of it since. And hopefully it stays that way. And that's pretty much my story i hope it stays that way too hopefully it never does come back yeah when you had that first encounter and saw that dog man in the road that day how close did you have to get to it before you finally realized you were looking at something that shouldn't exist man i'm gonna say somewhere around 80 yards you know and and i when i was telling the story you know it I stretch it out longer than it actually took for it to happen. But like I said, I, I saw it. I thought it was strange and it had my undivided attention. So I'm going to say, I probably, I probably noticed that something wasn't right. I mean, I was probably slowing down to begin with because, you know, I didn't want to hit a lab. I mean, everybody loves black labs. They're just like the greatest dogs ever, but somewhere around 80 yards, I realized that the proportions weren't right. And, um, you know, I just kept getting closer and closer and closer. And that's when I realized that the head wasn't right. And uh, I want to say I was 50 yards or less away from the thing when it actually turned around and looked at me. And that's when I was like, what in the heck am I looking at? This thing is deformed, I think, is the, the word that I you know, the category that I put it in in my mind when I first saw it was, you know, some kind of deformation or something. But that was how I dealt with it at the time. And we all got to put it in some kind of box in our head. And that was, that was all I had at the time. Oh, sure. He didn't even know about dog pin back then. When it did finally turn its focus away from the ditch and look at you, did it seem to be angry at you for coming along before it jumped off the road? That one seemed shocked. I don't know that I really saw a whole lot of facial expressions, but it seemed like I surprised it. And that was the impression that I got. Is it just kind of all of a sudden it just looked right at me. I was like, oh, and it just bolted into the brush. But I just, I would say shock was the look. Well, I'm sure I wasn't expecting you to come along. So yeah, that fits. Considering how big it was compared to a beer cat, how could you have considered for a second that that possibly explained what it was? Well, I knew it wasn't a bear. I'm familiar with bears. I've, I've seen them in Colorado. We don't really have them in northwest Oklahoma. There are some down in over in eastern Oklahoma, but they don't really they don't really come over to our part of the state because our terrain is so different and. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I can tell you, I'm pretty sure that there has not been a black bear spotted 
on the west side of I-35 and forever. I knew it wasn't a bear. I knew it wasn't a dog. And you're very quickly running out of options. And I'd never really seen a bear cat. I didn't know what they were, but I just kind of walked away from the situation thinking that the thing's head kind of looked more like a bear or something. And it was, it was the best I could do at the time. And, uh, that was just the only thing that I, I knew. I didn't even know for sure what a bear cat looked like until I looked it up. And, uh, still it just didn't, and that didn't even, I knew as soon as I looked at one that it really wasn't what I was looking at, but that was the best I could do at the time with trying to justify it in my brain. Oh, sure. Yeah, I understand. Like I said, you didn't even know about dogmen back then, so going the direction you did, thinking, okay, it must have been a bear cat, that's a much easier direction to go than to jump to the conclusion it was something that shouldn't even exist. So, like I said, I get it. Right. When you finally made it to your mom and dad's house, though, did you come close to telling them about what you had seen? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we don't have one of those families. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, uh, nothing against my mom and dad, but they're very no nonsense, especially back then. My mom and dad know what I do now, and they're pretty supportive. Maybe back then I underestimated their ability to understand strange stuff. But at that point in my life, that was not a conversation I would have had with my folks because I just I figured they'd think I was nuts. Of course, they probably do. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. But uh, it is kind of unusual when your oldest son just shows up out of nowhere wanting to look at the animal almanacs. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. How far were you from home when you had that second encounter? Well, that encounter happened north of Crescent, Oklahoma. And um, that's it was roughly 40 minutes from Enid. So, you know, not very far. Now, the second encounter, I did not even remotely think that was any type of bear cat. I just, I just to me at the time, I, I thought it was... Uh, a mutant dog or something. I, you know, like I, I told you before, I, I heard of humans that had that disease gigantism. I guess it's a disease and they grow to like really big proportions. And at the time I just thought that's what I was looking at, you know? And I thought, well, I guess animals can get it too. And I remember thinking at the time that, man, this animal ain't going to last very long. Some rancher's going to shoot it with his 30 out 6 or something out the window of his truck. But, I mean, I didn't know what else to think. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that there was some kind of paranormal cryptid running around that looked like a giant wolf. I had no clue. You were just hunting for answers the way anyone would. Yeah, yeah. I was left very confused. Like I told you, that's totally understandable. <laughs> when you had your second encounter, were you starting to wonder if you're doomed to have dogman encounters for the rest of your life? <laughs> well, the two of them were so different, especially in the face. I, I don't know that I really put the two together for a while, for a long time. I didn't really consider the first one to be a dog because its head was so odd. And it really wasn't until I saw that chart, that dog man variant type chart that was going around. It wasn't until I actually saw that chart. And I looked at that one that looks like a hyena and it just hit me that that's what I saw, except it was completely black. And at that point I put the two of them together and I realized that they were just two different variants of, of the same thing. One was a lot bigger than the other. But even the one that I saw that was the biggest one, the, the wolf-looking one, from what I've heard from your show, I mean, it wasn't even a full-grown one. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure if it would have stood up, it would have probably been much more than seven foot tall. But from listening to your show, 
they get a lot bigger than that. Yeah, that they do. As that wolf-like dogman was running away, he told us how he dropped his butt a little, but did he seem to be a little on the awkward side with his running style, or was it all fluid? It seemed pretty fluid. I probably would have thought it was quite awkward if I'd never seen a German short hair do it like that. I remember my cousin got a, a German short hair, and when we first took it out quail hunting and we were trying to train it, I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever seen. But, you know, you get used to seeing that pretty quick. But, yeah, I probably would have thought it was a very peculiar gait if I hadn't seen it before already. Well, that coupled with the fact you saw how strange of a creature it was, I think you're probably hung up on that more so than anything else. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of, uh, the whole thing was, I don't know, it was just, one of the weirdest things that I've ever seen in my life. And it kind of stinks when you see something like that and you really don't have anybody that you can talk to about it. And you got all these questions. And I know this sounds like impossible, but I don't even think I really discovered the internet for several more years. I mean, I, I probably went all the way to 2017 and all I really did was I had like this little Facebook page and I would buy stuff off of Amazon and that was it. I mean, that's, that's all I knew about computers. And it wasn't until many years later, I want to say probably 2018, that I really started researching this stuff online. And that's when, you know, all this stuff just kind of started rolling and I started learning at an accelerated rate. And that's when I realized, you know, that, there was really nobody in, in Northwest Oklahoma that was paying attention to any of this stuff. And uh, that's when I kind of started collecting stories and writing them down and starting to uh, document some of my going out and camping in, in places that are known for Sasquatch. I mean, it's kind of hard to find a place that's public camping that's known for dogman. Their behaviorisms are a lot harder to predict than Sasquatch. Sasquatch seems to be a lot easier to be able to pattern because we seem like we know more about them than we do about Dogman. That we do. Maybe not as much more as most people might think, but yeah, we do have a better beat on Sasquatch than we do with Dogman. It sounds like you handled all of your encounters remarkably well without any long-lasting problems. Is that an accurate assessment, Brian? Well, I think I was fortunate, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think that you could be eased into the dogman world more gently, I guess. You know, you see them in the daytime. You see them at a distance. You see them from a vehicle. I guess I'm, I'm pretty, as far as people who have witnessed one, I'm pretty sheltered, pretty fortunate. You know, it's changed a lot of things in the way I interact with the woods. But, you know, I still hunt occasionally. I still go out in the woods constantly. I know they're out there. But to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's shows like yours and, and some of these other shows out there and talking to people that, you know, I realize that I don't really think they're out to get us. Like we talked about before, I think. I think they enjoy scaring us. I think they like showing themselves to us sometimes, but I don't think they're really out to get us. I mean, you know, I think I heard somebody say, you know, if, if they're out to kill us, they're not very good at it. I don't remember who said that, but, you know, it's, it's true. <laughs> I don't think they're out to get us. I couldn't agree more. If they were out to get us, then, yeah, the numbers would be totally different than what they are. Of course, you're going to have some deviant examples, but by and large, look at the numbers. It's obvious they just want to get a rise out of us in most cases. If anyone listening wants to share a dogman encounter they've had with you, Brian, how can they do that? Well, uh, you could uh, hit me up via email. My email address is reddirtcryptids at gmail.com. Or you could just uh, go to our Facebook page. And hit me up on Messenger. It's just Red Dirt Cryptid Investigations. 
And uh, my name is Brian Terrell. You can just shoot me a message. And I would really love to hear your story. And, uh, you know, the truth is, is it's kind of our duty to document what we've seen so that other people can learn from it. And uh, I think that work is, is very important. I think the work that you're doing is very important. But uh, I think people also need to realize that these things are everywhere, even Northwest Oklahoma. And I'm just uh, doing what I can to uh, bring some information out there to the people in my area. And uh, hopefully some eyes get opened. And and if somebody did need some help or if somebody needs somebody to talk to that's a local boy, I hope that they would feel comfortable talking to me. I sure hope they would too. So please keep doing what you're doing. It's obvious you're doing a great job. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. But having said that, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of all these experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Well, it's an honor. I mean, you know, I've been listening to your show off and on for a couple of years. And now that I actually reached out to you, I, I don't know why I waited this long. The process was easier than I thought of getting a hold of you. Well, I'm so glad you finally did reach out. Only regret is, yeah, I wish you would have contacted me earlier as well, but (laughs) better late than never. So, yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah. Well, thanks again so much for your time, Brian, and have a great night.